Hello, friends and colleagues, and welcome to episode 104 of Dermosphere, the podcast by dermatologists, for dermatologists, and for the dermatologically curious. I am one of your hosts. My name is Luke Johnson. I'm a pediatric dermatologist and general dermatologist with the University of Utah. And joining me, of course, is... This is Michelle Tarbox. I'm an associate professor of dermatology and dermatopathology at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in beautiful, sunny Lubbock, Texas. Our mission on Dermosphere is to bring you updates from the latest dermatologic literature so that you have more time in your day to take care of patients, etc., instead of having to spend that time flipping through journal articles. And of course, the quasi-unofficial third member of Team Dermosphere is The Pimping Bell... The Pimping Bell exists to highlight especially noteworthy or questionable content, so when the Pimping Bell rings, take a listen. And by the way, pimping uh, is a term used in medicine (laughs) to describe how senior doctors might ask junior doctors a question. That's known as pimping them for historical reasons of which I am unaware. Well, Michelle, let me talk to you about something else. And now for something completely different, a little bit, a little bit different. How do you feel about hydradenitis separativa? I think hydradenitis separativa is one of the most important diagnoses for dermatologists to be fluent in the treatment of and comfortable discussing because it's so impactful to the patient's quality of life. Um, I think that it's, it's hard to come up with another condition that quite impact so many important areas of social and physical function than HS. So I think all of us need to learn as much as we can about this condition. That was much more detailed than I would have said. I would have just said hydradenitis <laughs> separativa sucks. And it sucks for a lot of reasons. One reason is because medicines don't really work very well for it a lot of the time. Sometimes they do. There's only one FDA approved medicine currently for it, adalimumab. So this is the phase three trials that will likely get secukinumab FDA approved for hydradenitis separativa. This was published in The Lancet, and the title is Secukinumab in Moderate to Severe Hydradenitis Separativa, parenthesis, Sunshine and Sunrise, Week 16 and Week 52 results of two identical multi-center randomized placebo-controlled double-blind phase three trials. Of course, this is a huge group of people who worked on this, the first author is listed as Alexa Kimball and the senior author as Elisa (laughs) Muschianisi. So this was a large multi-center international placebo controlled trial. Actually, it was two trials with about 1200 patients. They were all adults. So they were all age 18 or more. And they all had moderate to severe hydradenitis separativa, though I will say they didn't have super severe HS because Participants were excluded if they had over 20 fistulae. So they tried two different doses of secukinumab, 300 milligrams Q4 weeks or Q2 weeks. By the way, the dosing for psoriasis is 300 milligrams weekly for five doses. And then after that, it's Q4 weeks. And the primary endpoint was what they called a clinical response at week 16, which which they defined as a 50% decrease in abscesses and inflammatory nodules. I'm not a study trial designer person, so I'm not quite sure why this was two identical trials instead of just one big trial. I assume it has to do with like logistics and stuff. And my feeling is that it kind of like clouds the data because it's like it was 45% in this trial and 42% in this trial. So like I just put them together, but whatever. It's still nice. I mean, obviously, this is a huge undertaking and expensive and all that. So overall, about 45% of of patients on treatment achieved this clinical response, 45%, compared to placebo, where the number was about 35%. So 45% versus 35%. You can see why I was less excited about this after reading the trial, Uh but still, it's better than nothing. The Q2 week dosing does seem better than the Q4 week dosing, as in one of those two trials, the Q4 week group was equivalent to placebo. So not not super awesome. So the number needed to treat is like 10 if we're talking about 45% versus 35%, which is kind of a lot. 
but it's something, and hydradenitis separativa could certainly use more things to treat it. And also the trials for adalimumab that got it approved weren't super awesome either. I looked them up just to remind myself, and it was like 50% response in this treatment group versus 28% in this placebo group. But I will say that I've had some patients who do really well on adalimumab. It seems to work actually better in real life than in the trials, so maybe we'll get lucky with secukinumab as well. How about cost? Secukinumab is $14,000 per month if you're dosing Q2 weeks. Adalimumab is about the same. Maybe adalimumab has some more potential adverse events. It's a TNF inhibitor. I usually think of those as a little dirtier than these more targeted things. Perhaps biosimilars could bring down the cost. There are adalimumab biosimilars now. Though I poked around quickly on GoodRx and it looks like the biosimilars are equivalent in price to the brand name adalimumab. So what the heck is the point? So if the number needed to treat is 10, then that means we are spending $140,000 per month as a society, basically, to achieve this clinical response in one person with hydradenitis separativa, which I'm not saying is not worth it, but at least something that, of course, we should be considering. The authors obliquely refer to the rather disappointing results by commenting that HS is a difficult disease to treat and often requires multimodal therapy, which is fair. And they say that it usually requires both medical and surgical approaches, which it does. I think the HS experts, especially in the past few years, have been advocating a lot more procedural approaches to these instead of just relying mm-hmm. on medicines, you know, excise the sinus tracts, punch excise these things before they start to get worse, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And the authors also point out that a high placebo response is a known thing in HS trials. Perhaps it's regression to the mean. Like if you enroll somebody when they're moderate to severe, just by natural disease fluctuation, they're going to be mild a fair amount of the time. Also, they say this is an argument in favor of using placebos, especially if you're studying hydradenitis separativa, because if you just get 30 people with HS and you put them on spironolactone and half of them respond, well, who knows if that was actually the drug or not, which I think is fair. We previously discussed another article which stated that there should be like three arms, placebo plus drug plus the group where you just do nothing with so that you can really see kind of how it would pan out in real life. So it'll be nice to have something else we can like actually get approved for our patients to try if they have HS. I will say based on these results, I would use adalimumab first. And if they don't respond to go to secukinumab, I don't think there's a pressing reason why you couldn't hypothetically do both, though. I don't think most people are going to do that at the beginning anyway. Remember that secukinumab, just as you said in the last article, blocks interleukin-17. It specifically blocks, blocks IL-17A. And also remember that HS is associated with a bunch of other stuff. We've discussed HS a lot in this podcast, but remember inflammatory bowel disease, for example, and fungal infections. Apparently also blocking IL-23 with medicines like risenkizumab and guselkumab has been trialed in HS and has not been helpful. So don't use those things. As you might expect, of course, this trial was sponsored by the makers of secukinumab. I appreciate them sponsoring it. I wish the results were better. You know, I think that part of the challenge that we run up against with HS is it's kind of unlike anything else that we take care of as dermatologists because it creates structures. So psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, you can have lichenification, you can have skin thickening. There are some degrees of permanence to some of that change. But those sinus tracts, once they're there, will always have bacteria in them and will always be a potential source of inflammation and drainage. So we're kind of looking at these as the efficacy of like a bomb defense system for a city that's already been bombed at the ability for this bomb defense system to maintain functional plumbing. Like the damage that's been done has been done. And so then you have to do structural work to fix it. And so I think we need a little bit of a paradigm shift with this condition. One of the things that I think is very important and kind of goes along with what you were discussing with like the echo um, education of our primary care colleagues is helping educate our primary care, our OB-GYN colleagues, our pediatric colleagues as to what HS is, when it's becoming active and when it's an emergency to get to the dermatologist, because the longer it's active and making structures, the more difficult it will be to treat for that patient's lifetime unless something surgical is done to those structures. So I think that 
that's part of the issue that we run into with HS. I consider it a dermatologic urgency because the longer it's active, the more it's destroying nor normal anatomy and the more it's making these pathological sinus tracts that will create ongoing and lasting inflammation and scarring unless something significant is done to it. So it, it, it is a hard row to hoe. So I think that um, that's also probably part of the reason for this regression to the mean question about the washout effect of eth efficacy in these studies because it is also a very heterogeneic disease. It has hormonal influences. It has um, effects from environmental pollutants. I think that's something we're going to learn more and more about. And I think that's part of the reason also why it disproportionately affects patients of color and people with um, lower socioeconomic status, because I know personally there's areas in in the surrounding neighborhoods and areas of where I practice where the water quality is compromised, either from oil drilling or from stockyards. And I mean, these are things we know we have water quality issues. And the, the number of patients with the severity of disease I see coming from these areas makes me concerned that that might be playing also a role. So there's so much about this disease we don't fully understand. I'm grateful for the attention it's getting now that therapeutics are being directed toward it. I feel like Medical conditions tend to get ignored unless there's a therapeutic specifically for that condition. And then suddenly people have more bandwidth about it. And of course, that's because of money, right? Like that runs the world. And when these big pharmaceutical companies have an interest in the disease because they have a therapeutic to target it, there can be a lot of good that comes out of, okay, we have something to treat this. But I agree with you that we need to make sure it's meaningful also. And I think some of the problem is a lot of us wait until the house is burned down before we turn on the fire hose with this condition. Those are some great points, Michelle. Also, it's kind of interesting that we're trying to co-opt existing drugs that were developed for a different disease and kind of see if they work in HS. I suppose people are probably working on HS-specific stuff. I like the idea of using something that exists if it's going to work for something else, but doesn't it seem like we should like figure out what drives HS and then develop a medicine to treat that in some ways? But you're right that it's multifactorial. I like your analogy of bombs and burning houses and things. I will say that the majority of HS patients I have when I like tell them we should probably like cut on you, they're like, no, just give me drugs and washes and creams and things. You're not cutting on this these areas. So I don't know where the conversation needs to go in order to convince our patients that it's the right long term decision. I mean, I think just educating them about what a sinus tract is, like I draw a lot of pictures in my practice to show patients that, you know, this is what's under the skin. This is why it's leaking. It's got bacteria all on the inside. Your immune system is mad at it. So there's inflammation there. There's white blood cells trying to kill these bacteria, but they're in this bunker where they're kind of protected by a biofilm. It's like a, you know, very, I get a little dramatic when I'm explaining things to patients, but I find a little hyperbole makes people um, a little bit, ha has a little bit of an easier time getting the point across sometimes. And sometimes giving a little bit of anthropomorphization to the bacteria like oh, these are the enemies in the tunnels here and they're protected by this biofilm it's just you know you can give them some education about why you might need to do a different therapeutic i also think that you know of course we group these things into groups that look like the same thing to us but i don't know that they're all exactly the same thing there's a subset of patients typically women um usually um 30s to 50s and usually a little bit higher BMI that can have comorbidity of psoriasis and HS. And in those patients, I really do think that the cytokine signaling is probably very similar and using the psoriasis biologics for those patients probably makes sense. But there may be another pathway that's involved with different patients who have HS, like we all have those patients we treat that don't make sense for having HS, like a patient who's very thin that doesn't have any of the other risk factors, they're not a smoker, but they have this crazy HS out of nowhere. I think that like psoriasis, like atopic dermatitis, these are clusters of conditions that look the same to us that we put in the same category, but maybe don't behave the same way on a molecular basis. And as we understand better the pathophysiology of these conditions, we can target them more precisely and hopefully have better efficacy. I think a combination of that and intervening with therapeutics or techniques that deal with the structural issues or preventing the structural issues from occurring in the first place is the pathway to success with HS. Good talk. <laughs> I have strong feelings about this because these patients suffer so much. And I, I, I'm like the HS person in Lubbock because I'm one of the like female dermatologists that sees a lot of different age groups and stuff. So I, I have patients from, I have a, a nine-year-old 
with horrible HS. I have patients from nine. I have an 85-year-old with still active HS. This condition can span a lifetime and it can really impact quality of life. Amen. So thanks, Novartis, for trying Secukinumab for it. Um, hopefully it'll <laughs> sure. work better in real life than it seemed to do in your trials. And we are not sponsored. We're just very interested in taking care of patients. 